Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our second in the series of directors' interviews. I'm Henry from Cornwall Film Festival, and I am delighted to be joined for the next half an hour by a director boasting credits in both television and film, including Saving Grace, Calendar Girls, Made in Dagenham, Cold Feet, Last Tango in Halifax, and Doc Martin. Hello, Nigel. Hello. Uh, Nigel has a special guest with him as well today. My son, Dash. <laughs> so uh, before we take things away with Nigel, just a reminder that if you've got any questions, uh, please put them in the comments for this video and we shall try to ask them. So Nigel, thank you for joining me today. It's great Hi. to see you, great to meet you. Uh, I was recently listening to an interview that you did with uh, the guys at UK Scriptwriters, a podcast. And I discovered that you actually come from a performance sort of acting background, uh, sort of originally. And I was just wondering if you could sort of summarize for those watching the story that has taken you from performer uh, to director. Sure. Um, it's so important to me, and I can't believe it shouldn't be important to every director to have done some acting, uh, worked with actors, been part of a group of actors. Um, it's everything. And I was lucky enough to be obsessed with acting at school. I did all the school plays and all that sort of thing. I then went and did the National Youth Theatre in London, uh, where we'd uh, every summer we'd put on a professional standard production in a West End theatre. Um, and all that made me think, well, yeah, I guess I'll be an actor. You know, it's kind of, I love doing it. I love the theater. I love the stories. I love the, the plays. I loved everything about it. So off I went, I was going to go to RADA, you know, the drama school, but I got a place at Bristol University to read drama there. And that looked pretty cool. And they had a TV studio there, a very old fashioned one, but they had, they had cameras and stuff. And I thought, oh, that kind of looks fun too. So I went and did that instead and um, did a lot of acting at university, but kind of it ended up feeling like maybe this wasn't what I wanted to do. And I started directing the odd play uh, while at university and kind of realized I was kind of like bossing people around and telling people what to do. And, and I think it was a gradual realization that I was never going to be a great actor and I was never going to be a cool actor. I, I felt like I was too wet, too middle class, too soft, too nice. You know, I, that I was, I just didn't want to play the parts I knew I was going to get, I think, you know. Um, so um, it was really at university, I thought, okay, directing. And I had a kind of blinding flash one day. I really liked photography. Um, I used to go, and have, go into the dark room at Bristol and print my own photographs. Um, and I liked acting, I liked storytelling, I liked theatre. And I suddenly realised, oh, hang on, there's a world where all these things, photography and working with actors and storytelling, all exist in the same sphere, and that's film. And so I thought, OK, that sounds like a good idea. And it was like kind of, duh, why didn't I think of that before? <laughs> um, it was easy enough to say, uh, but I came back to London and spent a long time trying to break down doors and get in. Those were the days way back when, back in the you know late 70s, early 80s, uh, where the union was still strong. You had to be a member of the union. It was kind of difficult to break in. And I eventually got a job as a runner, you know, literally a gopher filling fridges full of booze and <laughs> getting people's dry cleaning and you know getting their sandwiches and you know I found a job doing that in a commercials production company and in those days commercials were where it was at this was the days of Ridley Scott and Alan Parker and Hugh Hudson you know Chariots of Fire had just come out with Hugh Hudson who was known as a commercials director Ridley Scott was about to break through um and it seemed like commercials were a good place to begin. And mm -hmm. indeed, that's what I did. Uh, it turned out to be a bit of a, 
a red herring, I think. It, I had to kind of get out of commercials and try and get into drama, which proved more difficult than I thought. But um, yeah, so that's how it happened. Um, but I can't tell you there's not been a day since in my directing career where I haven't been glad that I spent so much time as a young man acting and that I that I didn't I was so glad that I'd learned so much not just about how to act because I'm not sure there's much to learn with that but um what it was like mm -hmm. to be an actor and not be able to find the performance you want you kind of had to do that for yourself you had to know what that felt like in order to help others in the similar position and I come across lots of directors these days who not only don't have much interest in acting, but never done it and don't, really don't seem to care about it. And that's kind of a shame because that's what you're there for. Not much else. Mm. So, you know, that's my potted history. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so with that, then, have there been... Or were there any directors as you were coming up, as it were, that influenced you greatly, aside from all the big names or TV programs that really made you go, ooh, I want to make that? Well, there were, but I wasn't really, it wasn't a kind of cult of personality like I think many people have with film directors. Um, I, I think if I had to pick a director out, I mean, I was, I was obsessed about the Beatles. And I loved the films. And it was only later on when I re-watched um, Hard Day's Night and um, uh, the other one, whatever it's called, Help, um, that I realized Richard Lester, who directed those, was a genius and how much those films had influenced me later and how modern and groundbreaking they were and I don't think people realize this but you know there's a great scene in one of the Beatles films they're on a train they're talking to a businessman with a bowler hat who's being rather patronizing and the, and the scene jump cuts to them on the platform running alongside the train staring to the window and then jump cuts jump cuts to them back inside and I remember even at kind of 10 years old thinking whoa you can do that you can break the rules like that. You can just kind of have them there, then suddenly have them there. And I think um, Richard Lester is is much admired amongst, amongst directors. Stephen um, Soddenberg uh, wrote a whole thing about him. He's kind of the director's director. So him, I was also a big fan of what, you know, in the um, 70s and 80s, there used to be a thing on TV called Play for Today. And they used to do single plays, mostly in the studio, but sometimes uh, shot on location. Um, Ken Loach with Kathy Come Home uh, kind of started there. And they were a big influence on me. I didn't know the names of the directors, but I, I kind of, you know, great cast, great writing. And with Ken Loach, great directing. So um, they, they were important. Um, so, yeah. No, that's great. I mean, the thing that you sort of came to there is obviously it's that it's about that story that you're telling with whatever whoever's making it. It's you know vitally important to you know make something yeah, so really I've watchable. Never, um, I have to say, I've never been a fan uh, and tried very hard in my own work not to draw attention to myself, and I've never been a fan of directors who do draw attention to themselves, and even some so-called you know great directors like Scorsese, and he is great to me, go do a little too much of, look how clever that is. <laughs> and, you know, I always say there's no such thing as a cool shot or um, a great or cool edit or, you know, effect. Um, if it doesn't serve the story and if it doesn't serve the moment in that film that it's there to communicate, then it's no good, no matter how cool or clever or interesting it is. So all these, all the technique you learn as a director and all the stuff you kind of pick up, it only has one function, which is to tell the story. And it either tells the story in an interesting and subtle and multi-layered way, or it doesn't. And if it does, then it's a great shot. 
even if it's the most boring setup you could imagine because <laughs> sometimes that's what you need so you know um i've never been attracted to film directing per se you know the the, the whole idea of showing off with your craft i think the craft should be invisible um basically watching a film is is a process of being hypnotized you are self-hypnotizing yourself into a weird mental state where you believe that what you're watching on the screen is really happening and you kind of become emotionally involved in it. This clearly is nonsense because we know it's not happening. But for a while, for the hour and a half the film runs, you kind of um, hypnotize yourself into believing that this is real and you're part of it. And anything that draws attention to the fact that you're watching a film is a bit like saying, wake up, you're back in the room to an audience. It kind of, you go, oh, well, I'm watching a film. And so you are kind of great tracking shot or an endless crane shot or a kind of cool shot that where, you know, you can't work out how they could have got that angle. To me, is waking people up and losing that hypnosis they need to lose themselves in the emotion of the film. So I, I, I try and do a light touch. So I'm not a fan of directors per se, um, but, you know, probably um, uh, I love, um, oh, God, you see, um, I can never remember anyone's names. I have. It's okay, don't worry. But there's a name for the condition where you can't remember anyone's names, but I can't remember them. We'll name. see if anyone in the comments can help us with that one. So if anyone in the comments there can. Um, but um, who directed Local Hero and Gregory's Girl and That Sinking Feeling and um, Comfort and Joy? Bill Forsyth is a Scottish, British Scottish director. And I, th I think he was a huge influence on me. If, if you don't know Local Hero, you should watch it. It's a great. Okay, film. I'll make put that on my list to do later. No, it today. has that. It has what he was good at doing, which is what I've tried to do and everything I've done, is balancing comedy and drama, so that it kind of makes you laugh. It's kind of funny and quirky, but it has some truth. It has some real believable drama. And it's a basically a grounded film. I don't do fantasy. Uh, I like to keep things real, but I like to keep things funny. And Bill Forsyth, Local Hero is about uh, an American oil company trying to buy a small Scottish uh, bay um, in the outlying parts of Scotland to turn it into an oil refinery. So it's about the big guys, the big businessmen come from America and they come to this small, tiny or Scottish rural community and, of course, realise that um, they, they expect the, guy, the Scottish people to be idiots and that they can run rings around them and they soon discover it's the other way around. It's a great film. <laughs> Sounds like I, have to, I will actually go watch that. Oh, and people no. seem to be uh, people do seem to be liking it as one of the comments. Got a lot of saying it's an excellent film as well. And I think you know it's it's. I'm hoping I would be incredibly flattered if people could see how the style of that film has is reflected in some of the films that I've done. Mm. Well, there could be sort of that common stylistic theme as well to go yeah. to go look for in all your work. So everyone's get rewatching basically. Well, I've only made the, um, one film, really. I've made seven films, and they've all had the same theme, uh, which is people straying outside their comfort zone. You know, what happens to people, particularly yeah. a group of people, when they go beyond what they feel comfortable with? And, you know. and a lot of that, obviously, is there's uh, Calendar Girls and Made in Nagnum that has really uh, important focus on women and women's rights and identity. Yeah. Are you drawn to those sorts of stories about um, women in particular, or is it just something that you... You've... Well, I clearly am, and I, it would be uh, ludicrous for me to deny it because my IMDB page shows otherwise. Um, and I've been asked a lot why I make films about women, and the answer is I have no idea. <laughs> um, uh, I think some of it is a process of exclusion. So... Um, uh, I don't do car chases. I don't do things with guns. I don't particularly enjoy filming violence. 
And uh, so that excludes 80% of movies about men. And if, you know, if people kind of get that idea, then the scripts I get sent tend to be about women. But I love women. I, I've always um, been fascinated by women who, you know, it's a ridiculous thing to say, of course, that everybody is. But um, uh, I think I'm more interested in women than men. And the, the classic male cinema, cinematic character is the strong, silent type who can't express his feelings. Um, you know, the kind of the hero. And I've no particular interest in doing stories about characters who can't express their feelings. No, that makes, that does make perfect sense to me, I'm sure. Uh, so I've ended up making lots of films about women, but I've loved that. And, um, you know, um, I did try and avoid making Calendar Girls. Uh, I kept turning it down. I had a big success with Saving Grace, which was about Brenda Blethyn and her character, a middle-aged woman finding her mojo. And uh, I got off a calendar and I kept saying, isn't this about 10 middle-aged women finding their mojo? I guess it's more women, but it's the same story. And I kept saying no to it. Um, at the end, they wore me down. And I, my, my worry was, and the reason I said no, because I loved the idea and the script, the reason I said that was I'm going to get stuck with this middle-aged women finding their mojo thing, and I was right. It's probably worse things to be stuck with there, though, aren't there? So, <laughs> yeah. yes, it's uh, so on to the topic, I guess, of then you've been director on all those projects, and over a number of years you've obviously had various ones, both in TV and film. How do you sort of see your role as a director on set? Well. <sighs> This is a big subject. Uh oh, I'll, I'll cut you off if we go go I'll too long. Um, well, um, two things really, two things to bear in mind. Um, one is I'm the only person there who can't do anything. <laughs> I have no skills relevant to making a film. Uh, there are actors there who are great actors. There are you know, great photography, you know everything about cameras and, and how to light. There are sound guys, costume people, they're all experts in their field. And I can't do any of their jobs. And it's kind of important that I can't. After 30 years of hanging around film sets, I probably fake it on most of them. But, um, but there's one job I'm, there are two jobs that I'm there to do that no one else does. And that one is to look after the actors. It's incredible when you've got an actor on set who can't quite get it, can't quite find what's happening in the scene, can't quite find a way of playing that beat that works. How you look around and realise, oh shit, I'm on my own. Now. <laughs> the producers won't help you, the crew don't want to talk to the actors you're completely there and the actors the whole cast look at you as a director and go go on then say something clever and you better have something clever to say so as i said earlier the only way that's your job is to help the cast through this thing and um nobody else can help you with that so if you're going to take that job on, be aware that your 90% of what you do is there helping the actors. And so you need to know quite a lot about actors, what they do, how they do it, what they need to know to do it well, and what kind of environment works well for them. And all these things are subtle and difficult. And all these things are, every actor is different. I mean, take Calendar Girls, for example. Helen Mirren and Julie Walters are two completely and utterly different actors. Helen Mirren has no idea what she's going to do from take to take. She just kind of, she waits to hear that word action and she throws herself in, flailing around. It's sometimes brilliant, it's sometimes hopeless, you don't know what you're going to get, but it's exciting. Julie has got it all worked out in advance, knows exactly what she wants to do, is exactly the same every time. So there's two actors who approach it entirely differently. And my job is to help them both. 
Um, and clearly, I would have wildly different ways of dealing with those two different actors, given their approaches are so different. They're all just so different kind of people um, and different personalities, different characters. So it's a fascinating and mercurial and multi-layered art. And my advice to anybody listening, if there is anyone listening, um, uh, that if you want to be a director, uh, and you're not interested or fascinated by actors and acting, then go and do something else. Go and be an editor. Go and be a, a, a director of photography. Go and be a grip. But don't be a director unless you wake up in the middle of the night thinking about your actors and how you can help them, because that's what you're there to do. Now, how do you know what to say to them? Ooh, I don't know. How do you know what to say to them? Well. The other thing, the other place that you're on your own as a director is the script and the story. Because what you'll find is that the crew, and you know, sometimes, you know, in the big Hollywood movie I did, there would be 250 people on set. Uh, and every one of them has their thing they do. You know, I set up the lights, I put the flags up, I lay the cables, I do the sounds, I put the mics, whatever their job. And really, all they care about is that. Um, some of them have creative roles, and but they're obsessed, quite rightly, with their particular area of expertise. And so they're constantly coming up to you going, hey, what about this? Hey, this is a really cool shot. Why don't we do this? We could start here, and then a crane, and then a steady cam. But they're suggesting that because they think it's a cool thing to do. <laughs> look cool and uh most of my job is saying no now how do i know whether to say yes or no is because of the script in the story i say to myself what is this beat this moment this fragment this tiny part of this story that we are telling at this very point and what does the that story with this um the, this beat what does it need? How can we tell this story as this moment of this story as clearly and as subtly and as distinctly understandable as possible? And so every question I'm asked, and as a director, you're asked, you know, probably 50 questions an hour. Do you like this? What do you want? What kind of chair do you want? Does it, should it be blue? Should it be green? Do you want it tall? Do you want it short? All these questions you're asked all day long, you, re you refer back to the story and you go, hmm, what does the story need here? What, what, what are we trying to do with this moment? What, do, what does this moment need to engender the right response in the audience? Okay. Uh, and once you kind of get that in your head, it's kind of easy. Because you know the script better than anybody there. You've been studying it, reading it, shouting at the writer um, for sometimes five years. You know, um, some of the scripts I've made have taken years between having the idea and um, actually started filming. So you know that script better than anybody. So you're ahead. You, you're kind of already in a, in a good place. Um, so um, most of those decisions are based on this weird balance that you have to do all the time between clarity and subtlety. So I have a beat in my story. One character, something happens to them, they have to make a choice. That choice is going to reveal to the audience where their head is at. Um, how do I refine that beat with all the tools at my disposal, the camera angle, the sound, the framing, the blocking, the way the actors move, the way they say the lines, the way they interact with each other, all those things. How can I pull all those things together to tell that beat of the story perfectly, but also clear enough so 99% of the audience get it. Now that's easy if I hit them over the head with it. 
if I'm blatantly unsubtle, then everyone's going to get it, but it's going to be boring as shit. So what I need to do is find a way of being so clear about that beat, hitting it perfectly, hitting the bullseye of that beat, um, and being incredibly clear and specific about what I want the audience to feel, whilst being incredibly subtle, so subtle that the audience don't know that they're being manipulated and that's what I'm doing to them. And that's what I'm wrestling with all day long. I've got to know what that story beat is, what it needs to do, and then I've got to work out a way of being absolutely clear about it, whilst being so subtle that no one notices what I'm doing. And that's kind of interesting. That can keep you kind of on the edge of your seat all day long when you're directing. No, definitely. I mean, it's, there's obviously some, uh, sort of, I guess there's big advantages to that, that what you've been involved with over that length of time. So it does really get into your head and you just sort of that muscle memory, I guess, of some parts of the script really, where you know, oh, no, that character wouldn't use that uh, prop or that piece or something. Well, yeah, you kind of, you know, you hopefully you worked it out in advance. Yeah. You know, that's what your prep is. You know, you, most of directors endlessly drive around or driven around in cars looking at bloody locations, going to casting sessions. Pretty much, you know, that's kind of dull. But most of your prep is um, looking at that scene. There's going to be a scene, you know, in seven weeks' time, I'm going to be standing on a wet street corner somewhere filming this scene. What is it I need to bring home? What is it about this scene? Uh, the question I always ask myself is, why can't we cut this scene? Because if we could cut it, it would be good. Because most of the time, unless you're, you know, working with budgets of 120 million or something, and you know, big Hollywood director, most of the time you don't have enough time. Most of the time you've got five and six pages of dialogue to shoot today five or six minutes of screen time and you think how the hell are we going to get all this show i could spend all day on this one moment you think so you're really short of time so you want to cut everything you possibly can from that script you want to go in with as lean a script as you can possibly get because that means you'll have a lot more time for the important stuff if you're not shooting stuff you're going to cut later so i ask myself can i cut this scene and usually there's a reason why i can't and that reason why I can't cut it is what I must come home. So I say to myself, I can't cut this scene because this is where we learn that she is, uh, you know, scared of something or she doesn't like him. And if that's why I can't cut it, that is the key moment of the scene I have to get. It's amazing how often you spend all morning giving yourself a heart attack trying to shoot a scene and you forget to shoot or to include in the shooting of that scene the very thing that that scene had to do. <laughs> because you were far too distracted with, oh, this would be cool or this would be interesting or, wow, this is going to make me look like a good director or this is going to impress the camera crew or um, this will be wacky for the actors to do. But it's no good. None of it's at all interesting or useful to you in the cutting room if it doesn't do the job that that scene has to do in that story. And you're going to have 60 or 70 scenes, maybe more, you know, an action movie, you might have over 100 scenes. And every scene has a reason why it can't be cut. And that's what you're going to do. So it's, um, it's a big ask. Um, the other thing I'm doing is, you know, groups of people who are doing a difficult job need a leader. They need a focus. Um, people find it very hard if they don't know who they're doing this for. So you've got to be that guy or girl. You've got to stand there and lead. And you've got to make sure that everybody knows that you know what you want and everybody's very keen to give you what you want. And you've got to inspire them. And um, some of that is creating the right atmosphere. It's like a party, like a dinner party. You know, you can't have 
a great dinner party if the atmosphere is wrong. So you've got to work out what it is you want the atmosphere to be. And sometimes, you know, I'm lucky enough to do a lot of comedy. So I like the atmosphere to be relaxed, informal, jokey, irreverent. Because to me, that's where the comedy is all going to come mm -hmm. out of. But if I was doing a dark and miserable drama, I'd probably want the atmosphere to be darker and more miserable. Because it's going to help. Yeah, no, definitely. The same place, you know. Yeah. Well, with that in mind, Nigel, yeah, we're, we're going to try and look at one of your scenes, aren't we, from one of the films? Sure. So for everybody who's watching, last uh, week we did this with some, uh, well, some images, and uh, YouTube decided to shut us down. So bear with me whilst I just get up this clip, and hopefully Facebook is not going to close us down this time. So hope, right, there we go. We've clicked the button, we've clicked share. So this is Nigel's website, which I would suggest you go check out if you can. Can you see it? No, you can't. Why can't you see I it? Can. You can see it. What can you, can you see the video? The of, page. There we go, that's what we want. Why is that hiding? So we set this all up earlier and it all worked. So this is a scene from Calendar Girls. So we're gonna play this and then Nigel's gonna talk us through some of it. I can't hear it. I'm hoping everyone else can. The boom. Right, so let's stop that share and just come back. So you should just have me and Nigel back on your screens now. Is it back just to us two? I think so. Lost my page. What's going on here? Yes, it's just me and Nigel back. Marvellous. So um, everyone's just catching up on that because Facebook's slightly lagged. But Nigel, talk us through that scene. And I'm sorry that ooh, people could hear. Some people had sound, some people didn't have sound. Well, um, what can I say? I mean, listen, it was an absolute effing nightmare. Um, I had 10 of the country's top actresses. I mean, you know, Linda Bassett, um, you know, all of them were the best actresses in the country at the time. Um, and um, it's really hard to do an ensemble film because you've got this big group of actors and they all want to be great and they all want to be, you know, the kind of most interesting character. And somehow, you know, and they're all clamoring all day long at you. Can I do this? Can I do that? Can I say this? Could I do that? Could or could I stand here in front of everybody else so you can only see me? And this is not out of vanity or out of ego. It's just they 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 want their character to to shine and to come across. So I remember when we got into this big sequence. This is the big sequence of them actually taking the new photographs. Everybody was wound up like kippers, you know, they, they were kind of, there was the tension in, in the studio, because we shot it all in the studio, was just very powerful. Um, and um, I had to buy quite a lot of booze just to try and get them all to calm down a bit, because they were all kind of mad with excitement. Was there a special particular type of booze that they liked? They liked champagne, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. well, that's an expensive oh, one to like. No, I eventually had to say, you'll have to buy your own now. Um, they'd all met the original real calendar girls and the girls had told them that they'd made a pact that all of them were completely and utterly naked in every photograph, regardless of whether they needed to be. So even if it was only a 
top half shot, they'd be naked all the way to their toes because they felt like they were all going to do it. So the cast decided they were going to have the same rule. So they were, the cast were naked, um, you know, at all times when they were, when their character was, and completely naked. Um, and this kind of added to it, you know, was just sort of, they were all kind of slightly mad with hysteria about it. So I remember a lot of calming down. But um, the issue with scenes with that number of characters is about focus. And I don't mean camera focus. I mean, you want to know who you want the audience to be looking at. And you've got to somehow arrange the scene so the audience is going to be looking at that character. When and then later on that character, later on. But so the framing and the composition and, and the the blocking, the blocking, it's a much underappreciated art, blocking. And by blocking, I mean the movement of the actors. Where are the actors going to stand? Well, how do they move? And this is kind of one of the first things you set, because the camera is going to have to be in certain places to capture that little look or that little beat or that moment. And you've got to know where the actors are going to be in order to make sure the camera's in the right place to get that moment. So the first thing you do and the thing that the camera crew and the sound crew and everybody, the only thing they want to know is what's the blocking? Where are they going to be? And I don't like to work that out in advance because if I do, I get it wrong. And when I'm there and I'm looking at the scene, I go, oh, I see now, okay, this, this is how it should go. But so I tend to work it out on set with the actors. But I remember um, trying to find places for all those actors to be so that I could see the right view at the right time. It was quite tricky. Um, but to some extent, the big scenes like that one play themselves. You know, um, where it's hard, is where the scene doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Or the scene is only there for expositional reasons. So, you know, in other words, to move the story on. And so you've got the actor saying, well, why do I say this? Why do I do this? And you go, oh, actually, I don't know. The reason you say that is we need you to say that so we understand the story. And the actors can't play that. So those kind of scenes, it's fairly obvious what's going on. And it's fairly obvious to everybody what each of those characters is thinking and doing and feeling. So uh, it's a different kind of job for the director there. Instead of kind of trying to explain and draw out the subtleties and in intricacies of how the characters are interacting, uh, that's clear, I think. You know, it's a simple scene from that point of view. They're all hyped up and nervous. So is he. They're in different rooms shouting through a keyhole. You kind of, okay, most people are going to get what that's about and what that feels like. Uh, and so the rest is the um, finding the rhythm and the nuance and the music of it. Um, so um, I remember um, there's a couple of lines in there. Julie says, after he says, don't touch the buns and closes the door, uh, Julie kind of whispers to Helen, bun toucher. And Julie um, improvised that line. I remember being very impressed and pleased with it because I really liked it. Um, uh, and um, yes, uh, I tried to give Philip Glenister, who plays the photographer, I tried to give him and the girls a kind of real experience. I kept them apart for ages. I didn't rehearse with them the two groups um because i wanted i wanted him to be intimidated on the day that he was going to have to work with all these dames and so i didn't want him to be relaxed in their company because the character wasn't so i remember kind of keeping them apart a bit um and that's it really i mean it's, it's um it's a set there. It looks like a real location. It looked really um, real, but um, uh, it's a set. And we, we chose a studio, I think, for the privacy of the actresses. I, we didn't want anybody uh, 
No, that definitely I'm actually looking through the windows. That makes sense. Right, I'd be uh, I think Nigel, it's time for us to move on to some questions from your adoring public, if that's okay. Yes, can't wait. So your first one is could you reintroduce your son in the background? We have people wondering who he is as he keeps disappearing and reappearing again. This is Dash, um, who is my youngest child. How old are you, Dash? Ten. He's ten. Mm. And um, he's quite used to hanging out on film sets now. He's been in Doc Martin. Um, and um, I think that's your only one, really. So far, isn't it? But um, he's pretty cool. And I think he's going to be an actor. Ah. So that's Dash. Following the family footsteps. OK, so our next question up is about Doc Martin. Yeah, we've got a few of those. Um, so, yes, there will be a series ten. Yeah, there will be a series. Oh, there we go. Everybody, uh, you heard that here first, last. I'm not quite sure. It. It's, it's official. <laughs> We're doing it. Okay, must. <laughs> must. We'll get out of this lockdown first. Um, the question is really relating to a uh, particular series or well, TV series. How do you change how you work when going in to work with characters who sort of know who they are already? It's a good question. I mean, it's, it's a bit easier. I mean, most, most of the nightmare of doing, you know, a pilot episode or a film is you do, you, you wake up in the middle of the night thinking, does this work? Are we doing the right thing? Is this awful? Am I really screwing up here? With a long running show, you don't ever think that because you know exactly what works and you know you've seen it. You know what it feels like, what it tastes like, what it sounds like. So um, you've got a huge advantage. You're not kind of groping in the dark. You know what the model is and you know. So on set, you know, if it feels like Doc Martin, you think, okay, well, that's probably going to work then. So this, to some extent, it's, it's easier. But at the end of the day, actors and directors talk less about character than you think. Mm -hmm. Because as a human being, one's not aware of one's own character. When you're going through life interacting with people, you don't think, well, I'm a sort of this kind of person, therefore I'm going to behave in this kind of way. Because no one thinks like that. You just react. And actors are doing the same thing. They're just reacting to things. And so every scene, every episode is a new set of things for those characters to react to. And, you know, they have to make those choices just as if it was a one-off film or the first ever episode, you still go, huh, gosh, that's interesting. What would my character do? How would they react if this happened to them? Mm, no, and, definitely. And you still got to make those same, ask those same questions. Um, so, you know, it's still, um, you still have to think about it and make choices and make decisions. And it's making choices, you know, that's all we do all day is, you know, and. That's what I mean about there's no such thing as great acting. And actors are all, actors are convinced there's such a thing as great acting. So they'll try and do great acting. And then I tell them to stop it. <laughs> we best not get too deep into the acting or great acting. Otherwise, I think we could be here for a long time. Yeah. Okay. I'm just, I, I, I like, it does sound very interesting, but I think I want to get people some more Doc Martin questions. Yeah, <laughs> How the hell do you do your blocking in the middle of Port Isaac? Well, it's a nightmare because, um, as everyone knows, you know, particularly in the July part of the shoot, uh, but pretty much these days all the way through, we can have three or 400 people standing in the street watching us. It's like doing street theatre. Um, it's incredible. I mean, people just keep coming. Um, and we have loads of assistants, ADs, um, it's sometimes with ropes to hold people back. Um, I find it really hard because I can't see the place. Well, when the audience see the scene, there'll be Doc Martin and Louisa and Bert, and that's the only people in the scene, and the rest of the hub will be empty. But when I'm trying to imagine it and shoot it, I've got 400 people in the way. So I'm looking around going, oh, I could do it there, and that'd be cool, then I could cut this way and I'd have that. As, 
But I can't do any of that because I've got all these people standing there getting in the way. It's like shooting a scene in the middle of a crowded cocktail party. It's like, well, no. Uh, so it's hard. They also, um, they react, particularly if, if Martin's on set. So he'll do something funny and everybody will laugh. Of course they will. So, you know, we have to say cut, cut, cut and remind everybody that they're not there and they can't laugh because the audience will hear laughter and they'll wonder where it's coming from. So um, it's quite tricky. Um, we, um, you know, we try and be patient because we don't own the place. It's not ours. And people come because they love the show and they want to see us make it. And that's kind of nice. Um, they ask stupid questions. My favorite question that um, people standing watching of ours, somebody once asked me, he came up and said, can you just tell me, is this a repeat or is this a new episode you're filming? Wow. Just, wow. It was hard to know how to reply to that one. Um, but um, uh, we, lo we love our audience. I mean, I, yeah, it sounds corny, but it's true. You know, thank God that, you know, the last series, the ninth series, was the most popular drama on ITV while it was running. It was beating Coronation Street. And, you know, that's, we, we love that. And so we, we, we love the fact that people love the show and we love the fact that they love it so much they want it. People come from America. We, we, you know, out of the 400 people standing in Port Isaac watching this film, 10%, 40 or 80 people will be from America. They've come all the way just to watch us. So you feel like you can't really tell them to piss off when they've come all that way. Um, so it, it is tough, um, but um, uh, sometimes it works for me. Sometimes um, giving the actors an audience kind of sharpens them up a bit. It's like, you know, they make sitcoms in front of live audiences and they do it for a reason, is that actors are funnier when they're in front of an audience. So sometimes I can get a little more out of the cast because they're being watched by three or 400 people. I should just tell you what, by the looks of it, someone who's from the States who was there watching series nine is watching this. Well, so, uh, <laughs> hello to you. <laughs> Quite nice. Um, now, for those of you at home, you may have noticed uh, Nigel has a guitar in hand. So he's a very big music fan. Uh, and we had a question relating to this. Has music influenced your work? Yes. Um, it's all part of the same thing to me. I mean, um, it's very interesting. Um, I'm going to get very technical now, but this is one of my things I love is um, the way music works is this, is you have a chord, you have a key. This is the key of A. And you take the audience away from the key of A by playing other chords. And so a point where the audience are desperate for you uh, to get back to that because it feels nice. So we're back home, back home in A. It turns out that making drama is exactly the same thing. You take characters and uh, you have the audience fall in love with them and then you put them in places of danger and you put them under pressure to a point where the audience are desperate for them to get back home. It's all about setting up tension and then the release of tension and the same thing. So when I, when I got into music, which was after I started directing, I realize it's the same thing. It's the same language. It's about creating tension and then releasing it. So that's very interesting. Music has a wonderful, no director I know will watch their own rushes, the, the raw footage without music playing. It's, it's almost impossible to bear to watch them without music. Music makes it work. It's like, um, it's like chips without ketchup. Who'd want it? You know what I mean? It's you've got to have that music, music. And that's because there's some magical thing about music that cuts straight through to the emotions, that works on the emotions in a way that's entirely non-intellectual, is entirely visceral, is entirely physical. Um, and it's a fantastic aid and tool to create feeling and emotion. 
in your audience. So it's it's vital. And um, interestingly, I'm Doc Martin, for example, um, all the music is written especially for each episode. Other shows have stock pieces of music, they just kind of pull out and stick on. We, our composer, Colin Towns, writes a new piece of music for every scene in Doc Martin, every new episode. And I think that's one of the reasons it works so well. We, we really care about the music. And I've always loved music in, in film. And, you know, there's a lot of music in Calendar Girls and Saving Grace in Maiden Dagenham, you know. Um, so there you go. No, that's great. I think we've got time for just a couple more questions. Uh, one of which was obviously what's next. Anything else aside from Doc Martin in the works? Or Yeah, I took a break from making films. I made seven films. Um, and um, uh, the last one I made was uh, six or seven years ago. And I I've taken a deliberate break, um, partly because they were exhausting, mm -hmm. uh, partly because... I want to spend more time with this one. Mm -hmm. um, I'd missed out on my daughter's early childhood quite a lot by being away filming a lot. So I thought, I want to be home more. Um, and partly because they're, you know, it's like they're, they're, they're huge things to do. They're, they're, they take two or three years of your life and they take everything out of you. And sometimes the cost benefit analysis, i.e., what you have to invest in them and compared to what you get back isn't very good. You can ruin your health for three years with the stress and physical endurance. And then it comes out and people go, yeah. And you think, really, was that worth it? Maybe not. So I got to a point where I thought, oh, I kind of had enough of this. Uh, and so I gave it up. And I, that's when I started doing Doc Martin and I did Last Time Going Halifax. And I started doing documentaries, which I love doing. I did one about Bruce Springsteen and one about Roy Orbison. Um, but after about four or five years of this, of course, you know, the old addiction starts creeping its way back in. And by last year, I suddenly found myself quite keen to do another film. So I'm working on two films at the moment. Um, both of which looked like they were about to happen, but then the whole lockdown thing, oh, God knows who... Uh, well, one is briefly um, a classic Nigel Cole film. It's about a group of uh, working class gardeners who work on an allotment, who end up entering the Chelsea Flower Show and taking on the posh knobs of Chelsea. Um, and um, that's uh, in its final scripting stage at the moment. Um, and the other one is based on this um, and my experiences when I was um, in my 50s, I joined a band and played in a band for the first time in my life. It was one of my ambitions. And um, I have a film script about a group of middle aged men who form a band. Um, and that's called Wasted. And uh, we're hoping to do that quite soon as well. So a couple of films on the go. I'm making some more documentaries um, and we're gearing up. We're in the scripting stage of Doc Martin series 10. Mm, well, it'd be great if obviously when it gets to that point, if you fancy sending your, uh, your features or if you make any shorts, do send them down to the Cornwall Film Festival. Of course. That'd be, you know, we'd love to have you down as well. So I've got a final question for you before uh, we go offline from Facebook. I was taking this from somewhere else, but what was the first thing you're going to do after lockdown? Oh, what should I do? I like shopping. I'm a big shopping guy. So I'm missing going out and spending money, but it's good for my bank balance. <laughs> um, I like guitars, and I haven't been to a guitar shop for um, three weeks now, and that's beginning to hurt. I, I listen, we're all, you know, that kind of social thing. You know, I mean, restaurants, meals with friends, family, you know. I can't wait to do that again. And working, you know, we're, we're, we're um, you know, nobody's filming at the moment. They've even shut down EastEnders, and you know it's serious when they do that. So, um, yeah. You know, I saw an article saying that the uh, the new studio is nearly finished as well for EastEnders, or the new lot is uh, nearly up and running. And Connie, I can see your post there where you were about to play a song for us earlier. Uh, no one wants to hear me play. 
it's something I do for myself. <laughs> um, and uh, but thank you, but no. Oh, okay. Well, Nigel, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been really nice talking to you. Pleasure. And uh, thank you, everyone else, for joining us on Facebook. We've uh, it's been great. So we're going to go offline now, but do come back for more soon. If you've got any more questions, do just send them across, and we'll see if Nigel is willing to talk again with us. Cool. Right. So I now do this. I say do. Anything about Made in Dagenham in particular? Because we talked on the phone about Made in Dagenham and its commercialization versus story. Well, it's, it, it, Made in Dagenham is a tough one because everybody thinks that was my idea because it seems like a kind of Nigel Cole film, you know, following on from Cal and the Girls, a group of women find themselves, you know, suddenly with a spotlight on them and they're taken out of their comfort zone. It's got all the elements. Uh, but um, Steve Woolley, who's one of the uh, more experienced and, you know, um, prestigious producers in London, produced um, The Crying Game and uh, Scandal and many, many films. It was his idea. Um, and uh, actually there was a script in existence when they approached me about it. And I auditioned for that film. I, uh, the four or five directors went up for it. Um, including, um, what's his name, who did Cats? Uh, yeah, anyway. Did, yeah. Did, uh, um, but um, and it was quite interesting because what the brief was, and they were very clear about what they wanted, was they didn't want a Ken Loach film. They wanted a popular, warm-hearted comedy drama. They wanted a big film. They wanted a film that would go out into the multiplexes and get a general audience. They didn't want an art film. But the problem was that the subject was the creation of the Equal Pay Act 1968, which didn't seem like a, uh, a commercial and warm and potentially funny story at all. You know, I mean, it seemed rather dry. Uh, so I think, you know, it was, um, it was a big ask was it what essentially is a serious film with a powerful and important and serious message is how could we keep it uh, entertaining? And um, I remember the, um, the, the concept I had, which I used all the way through, which was one of the school trips which I keep saying, do you remember when, when you were at school and you got to go on a coach and go to a museum or something or do something outside the school? Do you remember what, how exciting and what, how funny and great it was? And everybody was suddenly twice as funny and twice as sharp and twice as interesting. And you, how, however boring it was, being on a coach isn't fun, but when it's a school trip, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Um, and I said, this is what it's like for them. You know, they're factory workers. And suddenly, life's a lot more interesting. And suddenly, everything's sharp and vital. And suddenly, they're enjoying themselves. And, you know, I remember speaking to one of the original strikers, one of the real women. And she said, you know, she said, it was the most extraordinary time. We barely slept. You know, we were up late at night making posters. And we were up early in the morning on the... Uh, picket lines she said I was too excited to sleep she said I was never tired because it was just so exciting and I thought well that is that's the way we can make this entertaining is that we've got to see the way these people and Sally Hawkins character in particular are energized by this uh, you know get a new lease of life um, so that was fun um, I'd always shied away from period films. Everything else I'd done had been modern contemporary. I just thought, God, that looks hard. You know, you've got all this extra stuff yep. to do. You know, not only does it have to look real, but it has to look real in 1968. But that turned out to be a lot of fun, and I enjoyed that. And uh, 
I realised quite quickly that, you know, all I had to do was to take the credit for that stuff. <laughs> it was really the wardrobe and set and props department that had all the hard work. Um, uh, and um, I also, one last thing about Maiden Dagenham, mean, it was a real breakthrough for me. It's kind of technical, but if you can get it, it's good. I remembered talking to Helen Mirren on a set of Cannons Girls about working with Robert Altman. Now, any student of film should watch Robert Altman's films because he was a rare genius. And I said, what was it like? You know, what, what's different about making film with Robert Altman? And she said, I'll tell you what it is. She said, you never know if you're on camera or not. And traditionally what happens is you shoot a wide shot, a whole scene, and you go in and do everyone's close-ups. Mm. And there's a terrible tyranny that happens because if you imagine suddenly it's your close up the whole focus of everybody's on you uh, the camera comes in closer the lights come in closer the makeup people come in and redo your makeup the microphone comes a bit closer and you suddenly this all takes like half an hour 40 minutes to get going and suddenly the actor's stressed and as tense as it's possible to be because suddenly it's all about them and everything's kind of leering in on them and oh my god what am I going to do um and she said with Robert Orman you don't know if you're even in the shot he said there are cameras flying around out there but you don't know who they're, they're filming he just keeps doing the scene and he's whispering to the camera to do things to you he said she said I thought that was great it was liberating she said you never felt scared or nervous. You just kept doing the scene as best you could. And I thought that sounds great. So I tried that out on Maiden Dagon. I mean, I loved doing it. And we, rather than everything being presented to the camera and all about the camera, we'd have two or three cameras flying around on track, on the periphery of the scene, on the edge of the scene, finding things and picking stuff out. And, uh, the actors that adored it and they said it was more like theatre where you just kind of keep running the scene yeah. rather than okay we're going to do this fragment now and you know there's so much technical stuff in film where you have to hit a mark and you have to be in continuity and you have to do all this stuff and, you, and it drags the, the actor's brain away from thinking about what they should be thinking which is what's going on and how do I feel about it and um, uh, so yeah, I tried a whole different technique, which I now use a lot. So um, I, I learned a lot on that film. 